Chris Works, it's great to have you on the show, and you're with 7 Billion Reasons. Is that correct? That's correct. Thanks for having me. And you're in my uh, our, our social media management certificate program and working on a wonderful cause. Uh, and the reason I wanted to get you on the show is to talk about uh, how in developing countries they're using social media as a tool to communicate and I thought it was so fascinating I really wanted to do a show on it and then we'll get back to the exciting work you're doing in Africa yeah. alright sounds good so uh, you, you mentioned you've got um, basically I, I, you have towns that really have never had traditional phone lines in that now have a communication system using cell phones and this is that you're you're the first case where I've talked with someone who was interacting in my classroom with people across the planet working in this environment. And uh, would you just kind of describe uh, how they how this came about and how they use this idea of alternate cell phones and are able to communicate globally now in a way that wasn't really possible or uh, before? Yeah, great. Um well, I can't speak about the entire continent of Africa, but um, our work is being done in Uganda, so let me talk about Uganda. And more specifically, uh, we work in a city called Busia, which is on the border of Uganda and Kenya. Half the city's in Uganda, half the city's in Kenya. So on the Uganda side of the border, in Busia, Uganda, uh, about, um, let me look at my stats, because I, I want to get this exactly right. We have... Uh, in that part of Uganda, about 20% of the people who live there have indoor plumbing, and about 15% have electricity. And, and it's just a different way of thinking. So, in, in, of course, in America, plumbing and electricity are, are necessities, they're staples. And then a, a cell phone or internet connectivity might be considered a luxury, but that's not the case there. In Busia, they would rather forego plumbing and electricity because that's so expensive. They can't, they just don't have access to it. But they do have access to cell phones. And there are now, they, their market is consolidating as America's always is. They had, um, just about two years ago, they had seven um, cell phone providers and, uh, between four and ten because they're con consolidating. But so let's say, for the sake of discussion, there are about seven cell phone providers there now. And so what the residents in Busia do, uh, about 46% of the residents in Busia, by the way, it's population 60,000, so about half of them have cell phones. But because they don't have electricity, they, they have, very few of them have smartphones. So, so they have what we would call dumb phones. I know it's pejorative, but they, they have what we would call dumb phones. Um, but they each own two or three, and they have kiosks, electric, um, little electric kiosks all over the town. And so what you can do is you take one phone and you drop it off at the kiosk to charge it, and while that one's being charged, you can use one of your other cell phones. And so that's what the population that has the cell phones there, that's what they do. They'll, they just rotate their phones so that they always have access to a cell phone that's fully charged. So they have um, multiple phones, and then they go there, and I guess there's, they, do they pay, or is there a public kiosk, or how do they keep their phone from being stolen? Do they use a SIM card? Sorry for all the technical questions. You may not know them, but I wanted to know. Yeah, no, they, they have to pay for it. it it's, it's private enterprise, so they, they pay for having the phones charged, but it's minimal. I mean, even cell phone usage, their data plan, it's, it's a lot cheaper than it is here. So, for example, when I go to Uganda, I'll pop in a Ugandan SIM card, and, um, and I can have almost unlimited um, data for you know, the number of weeks that I'm there for 10 bucks. It's, it's, it's very inexpensive. <clears throat> and so um, I, I'm not really sure what, what safeguards they have in place if the phones aren't stolen. It's just so much a part of their culture it, that that's worked out. They, it it, it works. Well, it's um, all, and so what they'll do? Go ahead. So they'll charge their cell phones and and um, but because they 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 don't have um, smartphones, 
want to um, guess, uh, and that is internet connectivity. In addition to cell phones, a growing number in their population are acquiring iPads. You know, they can't afford desktops or laptops like we have, but they can afford iPads are changing the, the, the culture and in in Uganda because they're affordable and accessible to the population, but it's growing. Um, right now it's estimated and I said I can't I, because it's tough to even get a good census there. So we don't have really reliable even um, access to electricity, plumbing and, and so on. But it's estimated that um, currently about three to five percent of the population in Busia have iPads, and that gives them access to the internet, and that's a growing phenomenon. So, uh, are they tablets in general, or you you're, when you say iPads, are they just iPads, or are they Androids, or do you not you know? And you may um, not know. Yeah, fair question, fair question, because from from the marketing guy, right? I was using I was using iPad generically. No, you're right. It's uh, not the iPad brand, but uh, right. A any any kind of uh, yeah, Droid, uh, larger smartphone screens, um, or um, whoever the competitors to iPads. Yeah. So there, that's, that's not necessarily access to internet is through tablets, basically. Is that right? Right. So right. they might have a tablet for a family able to have some access to the internet. That's right. And they have they have internet cafes. It's not a cafe like we would think of a, an internet cafe. Um, it's basically a, a shed. You know, you'll go to a shed. Um, in the area we are, most of the population still live in, in um, pretty primitive, what we would call primitive housing. Um, some live in mud huts, many live in mud huts, um, but then um, there's a, a large number that um, live in um, cement homes or, or cinder block type homes. Um, and so uh, when I say an internet cafe, um, they'll usually have maybe a corrugated tin structure or um, just something with a, a shelter or a roof over it and that's where they can go and get internet connectivity. They, they, most people don't, in fact I don't know anybody there who has internet connectivity in their homes. I see, so they'll, they'll take the tablet to the quote internet cafe and then Correct. have access to uh, the internet from that location, is that right? That's right, they, and it's not on Wi-Fi, it's 3G. 4G is coming, but um, it's mostly 3G. So it's, it's slower than what we're used to, but it works. So on the, the, um, the traditional phones, the flip phones is what you know, might call it, uh, what are, how are they, inter are they using just texting, or some of them using Twitter? Um, what, what platforms do you see them using? Um, well, on their phones, they're using um, the text or Viber. Um, Viber is the network that we want to talk via phone or text, even here in America, uh, because it's free. Um, but they'll use their, their tablets, primarily their tablets, for their Internet access. So that's where they'll use um, Facebook and Twitter. Um, they haven't really broken much into um, the others that are becoming more popular here, Instagram or um, Pinterest, it, but um, Facebook. Facebook connectivity there is currently 600,000 people in Uganda have wow. Facebook accounts. Um, there are 36 million people in Uganda, so that's a, just about 2% of the population has Facebook in Uganda. That's a big deal. And then what about... Uh uh, the, what do you use Twitter at all, or or is it mainly? It seems like a lot of it would be texting, but uh, Twitter looks like that would be the next phase it would probably be involved in because it doesn't require as much data for transmission. Yeah, that's true, and and keep this in mind, um, their their posts look very different from ours because they don't have cameras, and we're very visual. So most of our posts have pictures, and we know from marketing, you know, you talk about this in your class, Martin, that um, the posts that include a picture or a video are much more effective than the ones that are just text. 
but they don't have the smartphones, so they don't have cameras with them everywhere they go. And so most of their posts are just text. So that's changing a bit because of the, uh, the tablets that they're using. And when they're equipped with a, a, a camera on their tablet, they can shoot a picture. But uh, no, Twitter will grow because they don't have cameras. So they're much more of a text-oriented culture anyway. And then visual. in your area, language, what are the, do they mix English with, you know, what are the native language and, uh, and so because you're communicating international. So I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know the native language of that area. <laughs> yeah, um, you don't know it because it's not really knowable. They're, um, they're all supposed to learn English, <clears throat> so that's their official language. But the, uh, the culture doesn't work that way. And, and I say that it, that you don't know it because it's not knowable, and that's because there isn't a primary language in Uganda. It's supposed to be English, um, but the education system there doesn't emphasize that they learn English. And so uh, most of them speak, if, if you would have, if you'd have to pick a, what their, their cultural language is, I would have to say it's Lugandan. That's, that's like the word Uganda with an L before it. So Luganda would be their next language. A lot of people think it's Swahili, but it's not. Swahili uh, is spoken in Kenya, not Uganda. Um, but it would be Lugandan. Uh, but most of the people that we work with do speak English, and that is what the education system there is moving toward. Um, in a city the size of Busia, where there are 60,000 people, there are approximately 40 languages. Now, that, that includes dialects, but... It, right, so you, I, I mean, I saw you, you, you look startled because you understand that as a business guy, 40 languages makes it very, very difficult to do any kind of commerce, whether it's e-commerce or brick and mortar, it's very difficult. Um, most of the people there speak multiple languages, not just dialects. In fact, our main contact there speaks nine languages. Now, this is not a well-educated society, and yet he speaks nine languages out of necessity. So we communicate with them in English, and, um, and they'll either bring it to somebody who can translate it, or they use Google Translate, um, but we can communicate in English. Oh, and really? Uh, we got to go to the Google Translate. So is that, is that actually, uh, at least in a pidgin language way, work? <laughs> um, it... it, it it's a tool for them. The people that we work with primarily, uh, well, entirely, um, communicate in English with us. And that's part of why we chose them as our partners is communication is easy. But for the people who can't speak English, Google Translate is an option for them. They can cut and paste and find out what we're saying. Now, it's not always great, but it's better than uh, some of the other translating mechanisms like Bing. The, the Bing translator usually doesn't communicate what we want it to communicate, but Google's pretty good. Fascinating. Um, anything else you have that, that you think would be a point to let us learn a little bit more about the, the world of using technology uh, to communicate and starting to uh, move into the social media realm as well? Um. Well, I'd like to I'd like to talk about um, especially when you get into doing work like what we're doing in Africa. There are uh, you really want to segment it into two groupings, and one would be relief, and the other is rehab. So, and they're not the same. They're not the same need, and they're not the same fix. So, when you have a crisis situation, it calls for relief, and and that means. Uh, that you, you it, that's what the Red Cross does or Samaritan's Purse. Uh, there's an earthquake, there's a mudslide. You go in and, and you deal with the crisis. You put a tourniquet on it, you bring food and blankets and clothing and, and, and medical supplies. So uh, the, the technology is being used in relief uh, by getting the word out quickly. So these are, these are remote areas that otherwise people wouldn't know that there was a disaster. For example, in June, yeah, it was June of 2012, two villages in eastern Uganda were swallowed up in a mudslide. Mm -hmm. But there were, and the world wouldn't know that, because this is not a region where 
you have news outlets. It's not like they're going to send the local TV truck with their satellite dishes and, <laughs> and broadcast live from eastern Uganda. But there were some people there who had um, tablets with them. And so, so buried under the mud, they could get the word out that, that they're buried, that their town has been consumed in a mudslide. And so that's how the American Red Cross learned about it. And we were able to, not we, not my organization, but we, the Americans, and other organizations around the world, not, not just the American heroes, but around the world, that's how we all learned about their mudslide and their fight. So we were able to, we, the world, was able to respond and, and organize. In fact, Amazon.com, uh, through Twitter, organized a relief campaign for these two villages in Uganda. And they ended up raising enough um, cash and also people buying merchandise on their site, it got love e-commerce, buying merchandise through Amazon so that the relief supplies could be brought over to eastern Uganda. And that was all because of people tweeting about it in, in from the from ground zero of their mudslide. That's one example. Um, another example would be um, the famous one in 2012. Um, let's make Joseph Kony famous. Remember that that um, Kony 2012 campaign. Uh, Joseph Kony, if you remember, um, is the leader of the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Ar Resistance Army, and and his um, band of thugs abduct young children, particularly boys, and recruit them into um, his army, which um, is responsible for several hundred thousand either abductions, deaths, we don't really know. Uh, but there was a worldwide campaign of let's make Coney famous. Nobody heard of Joseph Coney before 2012, but it was because of, of social media and technology that the world world's to Uganda and the Lord's Resistance Army. Now he has since fled, we think he's somewhere in, in we, like I'm so important. Um, the world, the people who, who know these things, believe that he is somewhere in uh, maybe Sudan, um, but he's no longer wreaking havoc in Uganda. So you were saying there are two things, there's relief and what was the other? The second is development, thanks for that, yep, the second is development. and. Uh, Development is um, a long-term plan because you, you, you can't help people in, in that situation and, and by poverty if you just keep giving them handouts. So well-intentioned uh, people, um, Americans, Australians, Germans, um, have gone into Africa to try to help and, and provide uh, clean water and food and, and clothing those are, but those are relief supplies, and and eventually, everybody goes home, and then Uganda looks the same as it did before. And so, so long term, the fix is development. Now, uh, and that's where we're involved, and uh, we we do both relief and development in in Uganda. But in development, yeah, social media is extremely important, and as is the internet. There are people in in Uganda. Um, who have developed their own um, relief organizations and development organizations, um, but they can only get the word out. Their only access to the world is social media. Without social media, they would have no way of letting the world know that, that they have uh, a need. So, for example, uh, one of our partners developed uh, an organization called Triumph Children's Ministry. And Triumph Children's Ministry uh, takes care of 50 orphans in Uganda uh, and, and they recruit monthly sponsors via social media just like the big dogs do. You, I mean you've heard of the other child advocacy programs like Compassion International or World Vision. This is what Compassion International is doing but on a micro scale and social media allows them to do it on a, uh, on a micro scale. They can take care of 50 kids because social media gives them access to the world. So, so part one is relief. Yes, social media is very important in relief because they can quickly get the word out when there's a crisis and we can quickly respond and mobilize forces around the world when there's a crisis. But it's also very important in development. Uh, so somebody who's in an impoverished community like we see in Uganda can develop their own uh, long-term strategy for breaking that cycle of poverty and 
and have access to people who have resources like the, the developed nations. And they do it through social media. So that leads to um, telling about your organization in the we have a few minutes left and I really love for you to explain it because you're in the development world of education and uh, let's start with why seven billion reasons and what you do and how people can find out more about it. Oh, okay, thank you very much for that. The organization, yeah, it's called Seven Billion Reasons. Um, it's a Christian organization um, and that plays into the name. There, the population of the world is seven billion. We know that we're going to have to change our name when it's eight billion, um, which is supposed to happen in about 20 years. Uh, but at this time, it's seven billion. So, so we believe that there are seven billion reasons to go and do something bigger than ourselves. There are seven billion reasons to tell people about Jesus Christ, um, and we do it through um, helping people with their crisis situation and then long-term development. Um, that's what seven billion reasons does. We bring uh, the love of Jesus Christ to impoverished communities that couldn't support themselves because they're in a crisis or because they don't have the resources necessary for development. Uh, we are currently working in Busia, Uganda. Uh, we take care of uh, 50 orphans. Uh, these kids have been orphaned either by HIV, tribal violence, prostitution, uh, which leads to HIV, drug abuse, um, or some of them are just orphaned by poverty, meaning that their parents can't afford to take care of them and they are abandoned. Um, that's very, very common in Uganda. So um, we take care of them using social media. Um, Seven Billion Reasons has a Facebook, a Twitter, a uh, because I'm in your class, Martin, we will also soon have uh, Instagram, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. If I get nothing from your classes, we will have a LinkedIn. Um, and so um, we use that to uh, take care of the relief, the crisis situation, but um, we're now using it in development. We're in the process of building a school uh, because we know that if the if the children don't receive a, a, an excellent education then they'll just continue to repeat the pattern of the girls will get married when they're as young as 10 years old um, families will marry their their girls off because they get a dowry um, and the boys will end up either in a uh, words resistance army or selling drugs or doing drugs, uh, they won't break the cycle of poverty if they don't get a good education. And so, uh, where most of the schools, they, they, do, have, they do have schools, um, but uh, the schools are not, they're, they're really glorified babysitting services. Um, the average classroom in Uganda has 180 students with one teacher. They have no textbooks, no pens and pencils, no school supplies, um, no desks. They're all crammed into a room uh, about the size of our classroom over at NC State. Uh, 180 kids will be crammed in there. And so, um, and also because they um, aren't healthy kids, they're malnourished and they have um, other medical issues, it's not an environment to learn. It's just an environment to kill time. And, and most of them don't go um, beyond what we would call seventh grade. They're on the British education system. So they don't get to go beyond seventh grade. We want to change that and give these kids an opportunity to actually go all the way into um, the university system. And, um, and we're going to do that through developing a, a high, high quality school so they can get a Christian worldview education, um, understand that through Jesus Christ, it levels the playing field, that they are um, as valuable as anybody else, no matter um, what their economic circumstances are, whatever their health issues are, whoever they, they are in life, whatever mistakes they've already made, it doesn't matter. The slate is now wiped clean because of the love of Jesus Christ, and, and we will provide an excellent education. Um, the curriculum will be um, first rate. We don't believe uh, that we should do um, anything um, uh, with mediocrity, everything should be excellent. So excellent education, excellent academics, and prepare them for life either to remain in Busia and be able to support themselves or to be able to go on to the university um, outside of Busia and um, get a better education and maybe um, even leave Uganda someday. 
So you and you actually have some houses and you have some education with a real plan to basically build an education system that addresses the real needs of them, including medical and uh, and food and others. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we, we know that we can't educate the kids until we first deal with the crisis. And so the first thing we're doing is we are bringing those relief supplies. Um, uh, and we've got a, a self-sustaining mechanism in place so that we can um, bring food and medical care and, and um, clothing and school supplies. But in addition to that, yes, um, we already bought land. We own, we own uh, three acres of land just on the, the municipal border of Busia. And the beauty of that is that uh, we don't have to pay city taxes, um, but we can benefit from being close to the city. We are right up against um, all of the, the chaos of the city. So kids can, can remain in the homes with their caregivers, but walk to uh, the location where our school will be. And I say will be future tense because we're in the process of fundraising so that we can build the building. Uh, the entire campus will, will cost $450,000 to build, um, but uh, we only need $50,000 to build the first structure. So $50,000 later and we will be able to open our school. Uh, we're going to have what we call school houses. So each, each small house will have three classrooms. Um, each classroom will have 10 students, so 30 students per house. And uh, and each house eventually will be able to convert into actually a residence hall for um, either international educators to come and spend a semester, a, a, a sort of a Teach for America program. Um, by the way, if anybody watching this um, is interested in applying for our, our Teach for Uganda program, we would love to hear from you. Um, but we're going to bring the best and the brightest teachers. Not, we're not we're not going to do anything second rate. So the best and the brightest teachers will come and help train the Ugandan teachers so that they can, they can teach what, what we can't teach. They, we, for example, we don't know anything about Ugandan agriculture, but they can teach Ugandan agriculture. But they don't know anything about, for uh, example, maybe um, coding. We can teach them coding. We can teach them um, uh, technical things that, that they just haven't had access to before. So. We'll bring our first-rate teachers there. Uh, maybe they'll live in, in one of our converted um, schoolhouses into a residence house, and, uh, and then eventually the campus will grow. Uh, we're targeting uh, enrollment of a maximum of 1,000 students, but we'll, we'll start with an enrollment of 30. Wow. So yes, we're in the process of, of fundraising so that we can build that first schoolhouse. Uh, we bought the land a few months ago. Um, we are currently farming the land uh, because we don't want to. We don't want to uh, give handouts. We want people to have the dignity of work, the dignity of earning a living, and that is a game changer. Yeah. So uh, after we a month after we bought the land, we hired people to clear it and plant crops. What that does for us is it, it shows us pre-construction what part of the land we should. Uh, put the structures on, and what part would be best for farming? We will we will leave about an acre available for farming, so that we can use that to feed the students at the school. So we'll know what part is best for farming, and what part what what crops grow best there. Um, but by starting the farm just one month after we bought the land, we've been able to signal to the community that we're here to stay, we're here to hire you, we're here to train you. Um, we're here to equip you, but we don't. We're, we're we're the same as you. We're no better than you. We're here. We are here not because we're the imperialistic know-all Americans, but because we're partners in this. We're going to bring to you the resources that we have, and you're going to bring to us the resources that we have that you have, and and together we're going to build a fantastic school that will educate the children and and lead to um, better employment and a better life. Outstanding. Um, I uh, just mentioned briefly how they can find out more about the work you're doing, and then uh, we'll wrap it up and we'll put it in the comments area. And love to get other comments and information. And uh, this was exciting to to get a look into another world with you uh, and share it on social media and YouTube. 
Uh, great, I appreciate that. Um, yes, uh, please uh, come to our website. It is the number seven, seven billion reasons.org. We're also on Facebook and we are on Twitter. Fantastic. So, you can go to 7billionreasons.org. Uh, there's a, a, a link there where you can um, contact us. You can contact us via email. If you prefer, then for us to call you, you can give us your, your number. We'll get back to you. But we would love to hear from anybody who wants to be involved with us. Either um, let us know if you commit to pray for us. Um, prayer is a very, very big, important um, element of what we do. For example, can I have two minutes to tell you a quick story? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I had mentioned this in our class, um, abductions, um, child sacrifice, human trafficking, the sex trafficking industry are significant problems in Busia. Last year, um, one of the children who um, I count among our 50, an 8-year-old girl, was abducted. Um, we don't know, we never will know probably what the, the ultimate intentions were of her abductors. Um, but she was abducted, and it was through um, social media that um, we were notified of that. Um, our One of our partners in Uganda um, got on Facebook, sent us all inbox messages, and, uh, and that's how we learned that this little girl had been abducted. So um, we then sent out a, a prayer chain literally around the world. We've got, we have people involved with us all around the world. So we had people in Australia and Germany and England and uh, New Zealand, Cuba, people all around the world started praying for this little girl, eight years old. Now, um, she had been taken into an abandoned house on the border of Kenya and Uganda. Um, we don't even know how many captors she had uh, because every, all the details are, are fuzzy, as you can imagine, um, from a terrified eight-year-old girl. Somewhere between probably five and seven men had held her captive. Uh, during the night, uh, they had smoked enough, um, we think, opium, that um, they passed out. This little eight-year-old girl and I credit the prayers of the prayer warriors around the world, this little girl knew that that was her chance to escape. And God gave her this little window of opportunity, and then he gave her the confidence, even though at that point you can only imagine how shattered she was, how terrified she was. But this eight-year-old girl was able to wriggle her hands free untie her feet, get up, sneak past these guys, get out of that house, and run for help. Wow. Amazing. And, then, and then also, you, you, you mentioned along with that, you used your network to recapture and bring her home. Well, we found, yeah, uh, through our network, we were able to keep in contact with the people who were, who were locating her. So... So um, they were communicating with each other from their cell phones and through their um, Facebook inboxes, uh, and that's how they were able to know where she was by communicating with each other in that way, and then they were able to notify us that she has been found. Um, I would love to tell you that the end of the story is we captured all the guys. That is not the case. They have not yet been, been captured, um, but we're hopeful that, that someday they will be captured. Uh, but getting back to um, why I bring up that story is prayer is a very important part of what we do. Um, we believe that she was rescued um, because um, God intervened, um, and we asked that he would. He did. We don't credit us. We credit God for doing that. Um, he intervened and saved this little girl's life. By the way, our organization is now involved in, in restoring her. Um, as you can imagine, she needs a lot of help. Um, medically, psychologically, and we have people there to help her with that. She's only one of many, many, many stories. You know this, Martin, every time I, every week yeah. that I come to class, I tell you another story, another story that's just like this. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, um, not one of our 50, but there's a two-year-old boy who we're connected with there who's currently missing. Um, he was abducted, we believe, um, in order to be sacrificed. There are witch doctors there who still sacrifice children. Anyway, 
Um, people can get involved with our organization. We need to know that you you want to pray with us and for us. So we, we really appreciate that. So if you can let us know that, um, we also need volunteers. So you can only imagine an organization like ours, which is still new. We're only two years old, and and um, we have a, a board comprised of uh, engineers, educators, marketing people, business people, and so on. But uh, we still need um, all kinds of other help. And so if you have specific skills that you'd like to volunteer, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you are an educator, a teacher, then please keep us in mind. Over the next year or two, we'll be developing our curriculum and um, hiring teachers. And, uh, and then finally, we need uh, your money. We, it, the ugly side of ministry, and people um, get squeamish talking about this, but we can't do anything unless it's financed, and so we need donations. And so if this has spoken to you at all today, oh, you who are watching this, um, please, yes, support us with prayer, with um, your time, and um, any skills that you have, and with your money. So, uh, Martin, thank you for your time. I really appreciate this. This is just a great opportunity for us, again, using using the Internet to get our story out, and hopefully um, it will affect the lives of the thousand kids who ultimately will be enrolled in our school but who knows then the domino effect of how many more lives this, this will change because Warren Brosman decided to do this Google Hangout one day <laughs> in North Carolina. You laugh. I'm serious. No, no. I laugh in a, in a joyful way. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. This is uh, part of the great joy of having our social media program is people like you show up in our lives uh, with a greater mission to make a difference. And... Uh, and thanks for sharing this, and uh, and uh, we'll we'll have lots of contact data below. We'll get it all. I'll get all your data and post it, and uh, and look forward to hearing more success. Maybe we'll do another interview as as the school evolves, so people can keep up with you. That would be wonderful. Thanks, I appreciate it. Absolutely. No, that's great. All right. Well, we'll see you in class today, and thanks again for sharing this. Uh, wonderful insight and the story of your great work and thanks for the wonderful work you're doing in the world too. Great. Thank you so much and yes I'll see you in class. Homework won't be done but I did this Google Hangout. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I know. You'll catch up. you got you got a few things on your plate. So uh, great, uh, great to have you today. Alright. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.